Welcome to the module Chronic Leukemias. My name is Karen Fancher, and I'm an Associate Professor of Pharmacy Practice at Duquesne University School of Pharmacy in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This presentation is part of the ASHP ACCP Oncology Pharmacy Specialty Review Course, which is designed for pharmacists seeking to obtain recertification credit or update their knowledge and skills in preparation for board certification. The activity is designed to be interactive with questions posed to you at several points. I will pause to allow you time to consider how you would answer the question. You may also wish to write down your answer and the correct response in your handout. So here's everyone's relevant disclosures. So here are our learning objectives for this module. This is just a reminder that there is one objective that is not covered in this slide presentation and is only covered in your handout. So please be sure to look there. So let's get started. In chronic leukemias, we have chronic lymphocytic leukemia and chronic myeloid leukemia, which are two very different disease states. And we're going to get started with chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL. We're going to lead off with a patient case. Our patient is a retired 68-year-old male with a history of chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. He noted significant and painful lymph node swelling in his neck and groin approximately six months ago, and his symptoms did not resolve with antibiotics. So he returned to his family doctor, where his CBC revealed marked lymphocytosis, and flow cytometry eventually confirmed the diagnosis of CLL. So just to kind of reorient everyone, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, or CLL, is a progressive accumulation of small lymphocytes, or B cells, in the blood, lymph nodes, spleen, and bone marrow. A sister disease to CLL is called SLL, or small lymphocytic lymphoma. But for our purposes, they're the same, and in the guidelines, they're treated the same way. So in this presentation, I'm only going to refer to CLL. This is a very indolent disease with many patients passing away from other causes instead of the CLL. In fact, you can see here that some patients survive quite a long time after their diagnosis. Survival can reach up to 20 years. This is primarily a disease of the elderly, so we're going to have to be very thoughtful about the patient's comorbid conditions and the adverse effects of the drugs that we may consider using. Historically, we categorize patients with CLL into the rye stage or the Binet stage, and these are detailed more in your handout. But these were essentially scales that measured the patient's disease symptoms or the burden of the disease at that time. Uh, did not consider any type of cytogenetic or other prognostic information. Early stages of CLL under the rye stage or Binet stage were known as rye stage zero or Binet stage A. And those patients could be considered for active surveillance because they were not symptomatic with their disease. And studies did show that timing of the treatment did not influence survival in these early stages. Moving on a little more advanced, RISE stage 1 or 2, or Binet stage B, those patients were more symptomatic or had evidence of progressive disease, so it may have been appropriate to start therapy in those patients. All the way up to RISE stage 3 and 4, or Binet stage C, those patients were highly symptomatic and required immediate treatment. Again, though, we don't use this staging system to determine when or how to start treatment in 2021. Uh, as I'm going to show you, we now rely on cytogenetics and other markers. But if you read the CLL literature or if you read studies about you know, how we categorize patients, you would definitely see these terms. So please be sure to read more about them in your handout if you're unclear. The more modern treatment of CLL relies upon genetic mutations and other prognostic markers. So the first genetic mutation that we'll consider is what's called the IGHV region, or the immunoglobulin heavy chain variable region. 
If you recall, your B cells are the ones that have immunoglobulins, those little Y-shaped prongs on the outside of B cells. And the heavy chain region of those immunoglobulins can be mutated. In CLL, having unmutated IGHV, which is considered less than or equal to 2% of all of the measured immunoglobulins, is actually associated with a poor prognosis. So again, being unmutated IGHV is a poorer prognosis. So why is that? Well, if the uh, IGHV mutation has already occurred, clonal evolution has already occurred. It's less likely to mutate over time and the disease is less likely to become more aggressive. So essentially, a mutated IGHV has already done whatever it's gonna do and we can rely on the disease's presentation as it is. We can also measure proteins on the outside of B cells. These are things such as ZAP70 or CD38. The overexpression of either of these markers is associated with shorter progression-free survival and overall survival. However, it's certainly worth noting that ZAP70 and CD38 are not routinely measured in clinical practice. These are more study-based markers so again, you may see them in CLL literature, but we don't currently use them to make any treatment decisions. We can also consider cytogenetic analysis to aid in the selection of therapy for CLL. For instance, deletion 11Q is associated with extensive lymphadenopathy, a more aggressive disease course, and shorter median survival. We also know, though, that a deletion 11Q is very likely to respond to the traditional chemotherapy agents, such as fludarabine and alkylating agents. So those specific patients may be candidates for traditional chemoimmunotherapy, as opposed to some of the newer molecules that we're going to talk about. Deletion 17P is the worst of all of the cytogenetic markers in CLL. Deletion 7P is associated with the loss of the tumor suppressor gene, TP53, and patients that have this specific mutation have very short treatment-free intervals, poor response to traditional chemoimmunotherapy, and very short median survival compared to patients who do not. So we'll be looking at specifically how do you treat patients with deletion 17P as we go through the slides. So this is just a summary table of the most common cytogenetic abnormalities that we see in CLL. You can see here that having deletion 13Q as your sole chromosomal abnormality is actually the most favorable prognosis. This has the longest median overall survival and the longest median treatment-free survival. Moving down through the chart, though, you can see that patients with deletion 11Q have a shorter median overall survival and a much shorter median treatment-free survival and the worst patients would be deletion 17P or TP53 mutation that have very short overall survival and their median treatment-free survival is less than one year. It's also worth noting though that these numbers were derived before the use of some of the small molecules that we're gonna talk about in the next couple slides, but it's still true in terms of prognosis that deletion 13Q is favorable, deletion 11Q and 17P are not. And this slide is just a summary of all of the information I just presented, uh, mostly put together to help you study. So things that would be favorable would be deletion 13Q as the sole abnormality, IGHV status of mutated, uh, low numbers of ZAP70 and CD38, as well as wild type TP53. And on the unfavorable side, deletion 11Q, deletion 17P, unmutated IGHV, high levels of ZAP70 and CD38, and having mutated TP53. So as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, CLL is a disease of elderly patients. The median age of diagnosis in the United States is about 72 years of age. So we need to be very thoughtful about these patients' comorbid conditions. We also need to remember though, that there are no standard scales to assess a patient's fitness for therapy. There are several validated geriatric scales, such as the Charleston Comorbidity Index or the Sears scale, 
but these are not necessarily routinely applied in studies of CLL. So it's up to the physician or the treatment team to assess each patient's fitness for therapy. There's a group out of Germany that uses some very visual references to categorize these patients, and I think it's very helpful to use them as we go through uh, our choices of therapy. So this German group suggests that younger or physiologically fit patients are known as go-go patients, a little CLL a go-go, if you will. Older patients who cannot tolerate aggressive regimens but still might be desire some therapy and derive some benefit from it are considered slow-go patients. And no-go patients would be frail patients with significant comorbidities who would not derive a lot of benefit but would suffer significant toxicity from our choices of therapy. So again, you won't see those terms printed in any guidelines, but I think they're very helpful to categorize our choices of treatment and we'll use them as we go through the choices. In formal guidelines, the choice of therapy is based on fitness for therapy as well as genetic mutations. So NCCN guidelines break the patients into groups, one, age less than 65 years without significant comorbidities, so those would be your go-go patients, age greater than 65 years and younger patients with comorbidities, uh, and that would be your slow-go patients, and frail patients with significant comorbidities, which would be your no-go patients. NCCN also stratifies patients based on the presence or absence of the deletion 17P mutation as well. So back to our patient case. If you recall, our patient is a 68-year-old retired male who has a history of chronic kidney disease, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. And after further workup, he is diagnosed with Binet stage B CLL. His cytogenetic analysis reveals that he has deletion 13Q and unmutated IGHV. He is considered medically fit to receive treatment. So the first audience response question which of the following treatment regimens is the most appropriate first-line therapy for our patient? Is it A, a calibrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, B, chlorambucil plus ofatumumab, C, fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, or FCR, or D, alemtuzumab plus rituximab? I'll give you a minute to think about that. So the most appropriate answer of these choices would be answer A, acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab. Um, this patient doesn't have some of the cytogenetic markers that we would associate with a good prognosis and a choice of FCR. Uh, likewise, ofatumumab is not a commonly selected anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody in CLL, and the combination of alemtuzumab and rituximab is no longer recommended. So that leaves us with acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab. So this slide shows you the first line therapy recommendations for a go-go patient, so less than 65, without significant comorbidities, who does not have deletion 17P. The preferred regimens are ibrutinib and acalabrutinib, plus or minus obinutuzumab, both having Category 1 recommendations, and a third choice of venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. You can see on the right there are other recommended regimens. Uh, specifically, the FCR regimen is recommended in patients with mutated IGHV. Our case patient had unmutated IGHV. Likewise, he was a little older, so this combination may not have been appropriate for him. Um, and in patients who do not have deletion 11Q, we could still consider fludarabine and rituximab, but the strongest recommendations are going to be the small molecules listed on the left. So to review some of the studies that helped make those recommendations, first, the ECOG E1912 study, which was a phase three trial that compared ibrutinib and rituximab to FCR in treatment-naive patients with CLL. These patients were all less than 70 years of age and required therapy and their primary endpoint was progression-free survival. 
The results of the E1912 study showed the hazard ratio for progression-free survival favored ibrutinib and rituximab over FCR, and the same was true for overall survival. The improvement in progression-free survival was seen in most subgroups with IR, or ibrutinib and rituximab, but not in patients with IGHV-mutated disease. So again, maybe that's the carve-out for FCR. Patients with IGHV mutation may be more appropriate for traditional chemoimmunotherapy. Um, somewhat interestingly, even though this study was conducted with the combination of ibrutinib and rituximab, the NCCN guideline recommendation is for ibrutinib alone as a category one recommendation for the first line treatment of CLL in patients less than 65 without significant comorbidities and without the deletion 17P. The theory behind this is that the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody may actually not add a whole lot of benefit when it's combined with the Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor, such as ibrutinib, um, and hence NCCN's recommendation of ibrutinib alone. The recommendation for acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab in the frontline setting is based on the results of the Elevate TN or treatment naive study. So this was patients who were greater than or equal to 65 years old or less than 65, but with comorbid conditions, who had previously untreated CLL, they were randomized into three different arms, acalabrutinib monotherapy, acalabrutinib plus obinutuzumab, or the historical standard of chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab. And the primary endpoint was progression-free survival as assessed by an independent review committee. The results of the Elevate TN study favored both acalabrutinib arms. So acalabrutinib alone or acalabrutinib in combination with obinutuzumab, hence the recommendation for acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab in the frontline setting. You can see here that both acalabrutinib arms had superior progression-free survival, as well as at least equal progression-free survival at 24 months and overall survival at 24 months. Uh, given the fact that this study was done in patients who were greater than 65 or less than 65 years old with significant comorbidities, the NCCN guidelines actually extrapolated the success of this regimen into patients who are less than 65 without significant comorbidities. So essentially, the study was done in a slow-go population, but the results have been extrapolated to patients in a go-go situation. The third regimen in the frontline setting for CLL patients without comorbidities who are less than 65 or a go-go patient is based on the CLL-14 study, which was venetoclax plus obinutuzumab versus chlorambucil plus obinutuzumab in previously untreated patients with comorbid conditions. So the study was done in slow-go patients, but you can see here at the bottom of the slide, the results have been extrapolated to the go-go patient population as well. You can see here that the combination of venetoclax and obinutuzumab resulted in a longer median progression-free survival compared to the historical control of chlorambucil and obinutuzumab. Uh, likewise, the median overall survival was not different between the groups, and both groups had similar events of toxicity. And the conclusions of the CLL-14 study the 24-month progression-free survival was statistically significantly greater with venetoclax and abinutuzumab, and the benefit in progression-free survival was observed across subgroups, including those with unmutated IGHV and TP53 mutation. It's also worth noting, though, that both arms required growth factor support almost 50% of the time, so this regimen needs to be carefully considered in patients that have other infectious complications or risks. So where does that leave FCR? Uh, if you're old school like me, that's the backbone of therapy in CLL, or at least it was. So uh, its place in therapy has been fleshed out in the CLL-10 study, which was FCR, so fludarabine, cyclophosphamide, and rituximab, compared to BR, bendamustine, and rituximab, in previously untreated, medically fit patients. 
So you can see here, when we look at the median progression-free survival of the entire patient cohort, it favored FCR. Likewise, the progression-free survival of patients less than or equal to 65 heavily favored FCR. But when we look at the progression-free survival of older patients, or what we would consider slow-go patients, there was no clear benefit. Likewise, FCR was clearly more toxic than BR in terms of neutropenia and infectious complications. So the conclusions that we can draw from the CLL-10 study are that FCR produced an improved progression-free survival overall, but not in patients who are slow-go patients, in patients who are greater than 65. And because there was no difference in overall survival, as well as more hematologic toxicity with FCR, the recommendations now state that FCR is only recommended as a first-line regimen for a younger, physically fit patient, especially with mutated IGHV. The other major benefit to FCR is that it's very time-dependent therapy. This is six months of therapy compared to indefinite or two or three years of some of the other therapies that we've already mentioned. Lastly, uh, the guidelines still recommend that BAR or bendamustine and rituximab could be considered, although it's certainly falling out of favor in clinical practice. Since we've discussed rituximab, I just wanted to take a moment to review the new product Rituxan Hycella, which is a combination of rituximab and hyaluronidase. This product has been approved for use in CLL, diffuse large B-cell non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and follicular lymphoma, and should only be initiated after patients have received at least one full dose of traditional intravenous rituximab. There's a lot more information about this agent in your handout, so I'm going to refer you there. But I do want to point out that the doses and administration times and vial sizes are different between the different disease states. So please make sure that you use caution when you read a question about this agent and when you use it in clinical practice. So moving on to our slow-go patients, first-line therapy for patients greater than or equal to 65 or younger patients with comorbidities, or are no-go patients, frail patients, all without deletion 17P. So here you can see that the preferred regimens are the regimens we have already covered, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, plus or minus obinutuzumab, or venetoclax and obinutuzumab, as per the studies we've just reviewed. Because these patients are a little older, a little frailer, you can see here that FCR is not a recommended regimen. Uh, the combination of bendamustine and some anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody could be considered in a slow-go patient, but not in a frail one, um, and others as we have listed here. The landmark study for the use of ibrutinib alone as the first-line treatment of slow-go patients is based on a study called Resonate 2, which was ibrutinib versus chlorambucil in previously untreated elderly CLL patients. And you can see here that hands down, ibrutinib was the preferred therapy. Uh, Progression-free survival and overall survival at 60 months both heavily favored ibrutinib. The other important takeaway from the Resonate 2 study was that the benefit of increased progression-free survival in patients who received ibrutinib was consistent in the higher risk subgroups, so IGHV unmutated um, and other prog poor prognostic markers, but also the quality of life measures were better in patients who received ibrutinib. Patients who received ibrutinib had higher hemoglobin and platelet counts, and they sustained those increases longer, which translated into a decrease in the need for transfusions, as well as less fatigue and bruising. So again, the results of ibrutinib alone were very, very clear. So what about the recommendation for obinutuzumab and chlorambucil in the slow-go patient population? This was based off of the CLL-11 study, 
which was a three-arm study in which previously untreated patients with comorbid conditions, so once again, our slow-go patient population, were randomized to one of three arms, chlorambucil alone, rituximab and chlorambucil, or obinutuzumab and chlorambucil. And no big surprise, the single agent chlorambucil was clearly inferior. Between the rituximab and chlorambucil and obinutuzumab and chlorambucil arms, obinutuzumab and chlorambucil had a longer progression-free survival, a longer time to next treatment, and a greater overall survival. And all of those were statistically significant compared to rituximab and chlorambucil. And so the conclusions of this study, obinutuzumab and chlorambucil had both superior progression-free and overall survival advantages compared to chlorambucil alone, as well as rituximab and chlorambucil. And because of this, obinutuzumab and chlorambucil is now a recommended regimen in our slow-go patients, so an older patient or a younger patient with comorbidities. The NCCN guidelines also reference something called lenalidomide maintenance. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time reviewing that concept here. This was based off of the phase three CLL M1 trial. So patients who had high risk CLL were randomized to either lenalidomide maintenance or placebo after the completion of their chemoimmunotherapy. The qualifications for high-risk CLL are listed for you here. So a partial response or greater after four or more cycles of chemoimmunotherapy, minimal residual disease or minimal residual disease with other poor prognostic markers such as deletion 17P or unmutated IGHV. For a better discussion about minimal residual disease, you can certainly refer to the handout where I have that in much greater detail. Unfortunately, this study was closed early due to poor recruitment, so we can't draw any substantial conclusions. But what we do know is that the median progression-free survival was 13.3 months in the placebo group and not reached in the lenalidomide group. The relative risk reduction for disease progression was 80%, which was statistically significant. But there was a greater incidence of adverse effects in the lenalidomide group, including neutropenia, GI disorders, and skin changes. And I'll certainly refer you to the multiple myeloma module, but you hopefully recall that lenalidomide also requires concurrent anticoagulation. So patients need to take more than one agent if they use lenalidomide maintenance. So the NCCN guidelines suggest that lenalidomide maintenance can be considered after chemoimmunotherapy. So essentially after a patient has completed FCR or BR. But with the introduction of all of these small molecules, such as ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, and venetoclax, there are no studies of lenalidomide maintenance in those settings. And thus, this is a very niche recommendation um, and certainly not one that's popularly seen in clinical practice. So moving on to first-line therapy for patients with deletion 17P. Notice now that the fitness for therapy is not listed here. These recommendations are for any patient with deletion 17P. And likewise, notice that none of these recommendations are category one. So although they're still preferred, they're not nearly as strong of recommendations as in the without deletion 17P setting mostly because of lack of patients in many of the clinical trials. There's just less patients, and thus the recommendations are not as strong. The preferred regimens are the same regimens as in patients without deletion 17P. Acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, ibrutinib or venetoclax and obinutuzumab. Other recommended regimens could be alimtuzumab plus or minus rituximab, high-dose methylprednisolone and rituximab, or obinutuzumab alone. But again, given the toxicities of those regimens, specifically alimtuzumab, uh, the small molecule inhibitors at the top of the slide are certainly preferred. 
So that concludes our discussion on first-line therapy. Unfortunately, patients with CLL are considered to be incurable, and relapse is nearly universal. You could argue with me that allogeneic stem cell transplant may be a curable therapy option, but given the patient population, that's certainly not a commonly employed strategy. So most, if not all, patients are going to relapse at some point and need to be considered for additional therapy. So let's look at a patient case who needs that sort of therapy. We have a 63-year-old male with CLL with deletion 11Q. He has well-controlled AFib and gastroesophageal reflux disease. He received treatment with FCR three years ago and achieved a complete response, but he did not receive lenalidoline maintenance and instead has been followed by observation. And he's recently been diagnosed with relapsed CLL. The second audience response question, which of the following regimens is most appropriate for DG at this point in his course? Is it A, repeat FCR, B, ibrutinib, C, venetoclax and rituximab, or D, bendamustine, rituximab, and idolalacib? So the most appropriate answer of these choices is answer C, venetoclax and rituximab. Again, if you're old school like me, there was a time where we would have recommended repeating FCR, especially if the patient had gone several years in between courses of therapy. But given the new agents that we have, that recommendation has certainly fallen out of favor. Answer D, the triple regimen is not currently recommended. And answer B, although may be considered, the patient has some conditions that I would argue uh, make him a better candidate for venetoclax and rituximab. So we'll go through these potential adverse effects and other conditions in the next couple slides. So as we said, with current therapies, CLL is considered to be incurable and patients will universally relapse at some point after treatment. What we do at their relapse depends on their current age and performance status, what previous therapy they've received, and how long their response lasted to that previous therapy. If they have been off therapy, such as in the case of FCR, we would also want to consider how long it's been since they received their last therapy. NCCN guidelines for second line and subsequent therapies for CLL are listed on this slide. You can see that the preferred regimens are single agent acalabrutinib, ibrutinib, and the combination of venetoclax and rituximab, with all three of those being category one recommendations. Other preferred regimens are the PI3K inhibitor duvelisib and the PI3K inhibitor idolalisib in combination with rituximab. You can also see that there are other recommended regimens on the right, but I want to call your attention to the very bottom, another Bruton tyrosine kinase inhibitor, Zanubrutinib, which is new this year, and we'll review its data in the upcoming slides. So just to review the data in the second line and subsequent settings, the use of acalabrutinib in the relapse and refractory setting is based on the study called ASCEND which is 310 patients with relapsed or refractory CLL who were randomized to a calibrutinib or the investigator's choice. And at that time, the investigator's choice was either idolalisib and rituximab or bendamustine and rituximab. With the primary endpoint being progression-free survival by an independent review committee. The results showed that a calibrutinib significantly prolonged progression-free survival and that benefit was seen across subgroups. The authors noted that there was no difference in overall survival, but there was a large amount of crossover from the idolalisib and rituximab or bendamustine and rituximab arm into the acalabrutinib arm, which may have influenced that overall survival result. The use of ibrutinib as a single agent in the relapsed or refractory setting is based on a study called Resonate, uh, 
Uh, notice it was actually studied in the relapsed and refractory setting first, hence resonate is in the relapsed and refractory setting, and resonate 2 is in the frontline setting. Uh, in this study, patients were randomized to either ibrutinib or ofatumumab, and again, no big surprise here, uh, all of the data heavily favored ibrutinib, specifically progression-free survival and progression-free survival at 36 months, so much so that the trial was stopped at the interim analysis. The conclusions of that Resonate study, again, ibrutinib significantly improved progression-free survival. The crossover trial design probably influenced overall survival. And just like we saw in Resonate 2, quality of life was improved because patients needed less blood transfusions and complained of less fatigue. So based on this, ibrutinib is now a category one recommendation for relapse disease, and there are multiple trials of combinations of ibrutinib in the relapse and refractory setting that are ongoing. The recommendation for venetoclax and rituximab in the relapse and refractory setting is based on the Murano study, which examined patients with relapsed or refractory CLL and randomized them to either venetoclax and rituximab or bendamustate and rituximab. And as you see here, progression-free survival as well as median progression-free survival favored the venetoclax and rituximab arm as well as overall survival at 60 months. In the relapse and refractory setting, we can also consider the use of the PI3K inhibitors. So the first of these was study 116, which examined the use of idolalisib and rituximab compared to placebo and rituximab in previously treated patients who had comorbidities. And as you can see here, the combination of idolalisib and rituximab resulted in a superior progression-free survival as well as overall survival. And again, this study was stopped at the interim analysis so more patients could receive the active drug. From study 116, we can conclude that idolalisib and rituximab significantly improve both progression-free and overall survival compared to placebo and rituximab in the relapse and refractory setting. And again, the crossover design of this trial may have influenced the results, as well as the fact that it was stopped at the interim analysis. But based on these findings, the combination of idolalisib and rituximab is now a preferred regimen in patients with relapse disease, even in patients who have comorbidities, and there are, again, other combination trials that are ongoing with both of these agents. New to the CLL guidelines this year is the inclusion of Xanabrutinib in the relapse and refractory setting, which is considered to be a next-generation, irreversible Bruton's tyrosine kinase inhibitor. There's a lot more information about this agent in the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma materials because its initial approval was actually in mantle cell lymphoma. But briefly, it has less off-target activity with EGFR and other uh, targets than ibrutinib. And it's currently recommended as a second line or subsequent treatment in patients who are intolerant to or have contraindications to other BTKIs in the CLL setting. This recommendation is based off of one single arm phase two study of 91 patients with relapsed or refractory CLL or SLL. The overall response rate was 84.6%, and the median follow-up, although was short, uh, still showed favorable results, and now this agent is recommended as a potential option in the relapse and refractory setting if the patient cannot tolerate ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. So that is certainly a lot of information. Now let's take that information and apply it to how we would select therapy for an individual patient. So this is our third audience response question, but it's actually in reference to the first patient case, a 68-year-old male with newly diagnosed CLL who will be initiating therapy with a calibrutinib. Which of the following adverse effects are frequently seen with a calibrutinib therapy? Is it A, hypotension? B, tumor lysis syndrome, C, headache, or D, periorbital edema? 
So one of the most frequently seen adverse effects with a calibrutinib is headache. Uh, tumor lysis syndrome is more of a risk with venetoclax, and periorbital edema is actually more common with an agent used to treat CML, which is imatinib. Uh, hypotension, I just kind of made up, so I can't even tell you where I would have uh, applied that one. Another question involving patient selection. So this is audience response question number four, but in reference to patient two, we had actually suggested venetoclax and rituximab for that patient, but he cannot afford that regimen. So instead, he'll be initiating idolalacib and rituximab. Which of the following statements about idolalacib is correct? Is it A, pancreatitis is common, B, diarrhea may be severe, C, lower extremity edema often occurs, and D, visual changes are frequent. So the most accurate response here is answer B, diarrhea may be severe. Uh, the PI3K inhibitors are associated with a significant amount of toxicity of which colitis is one of the most significant. Uh, these other potential adverse effects are not related to any of the agents that we're gonna discuss. Uh, pancreatitis, lower extremity edema, and visual changes uh, are not very common with any of the agents in this presentation. So as I said at the beginning of the presentation, many patients with CLL have comorbid conditions and patient selection for each of these agents is gonna be very important. So I'd like to take a few minutes and just review some of the more common adverse reactions for the agents that we've been discussing. So first looking at ibrutinib, there's a potential for bleeding events, and this can be anything from bruising to petechiae, but can be serious in up to about 5% of patients. The mechanism of this is not very well understood. It's thought to be an off-target effect of tech but also potentially an interaction with von Wildebrand's factor, um, such that there are recommendations to hold ibrutinib therapy for three to seven days prior to any procedures, as well as post-procedure, depending on the severity of the procedure. And again, there's more information about this in the handout as well as in the prescribing information. There is an incidence of AFib with abrutinib. Depending on which reference you use, it's about 6 to 9% of patients, including patients who have never had AFib in the past. Um, the management of AFib often uses anticoagulation. So given the drug's known risk of bleeding, clinical trials actually excluded patients who were on warfarin. So if a patient develops AFib on ibrutinib, and if it's determined that anticoagulation needs to be initiated, initiated it's recommended to consider non-warfarin anticoagulation, such as a DOAC or a low molecular weight heparin. We're also seeing some new reports of hypertension um, that is not recommended to be managed in any particular manner. So any antihypertensive agent that would be chosen based on national guidelines would be appropriate here. As a reminder, there are drug interactions. So when you're choosing a drug for atrial fibrillation or hypertension, you need to be cognizant of your choice. And there's an incidence of what's called transient lymphocytosis, which I'll actually describe in a couple slides. So hold your enthusiasm for that right now. Moving along to acalabrutinib, the most common adverse drug reaction with this agent is actually headache. You can see here this occurs in about 40% of patients and often early on in their therapy. Most of the time, this adverse drug reaction resolves on its own, but anecdotally, patients have reported they get relief with either over-the-counter analgesics or caffeine. So an extra cup of coffee or Diet Coke may be in order here. There is an incidence of bleeding and hypertension and AFib like we saw with ibrutinib, but these are reportedly lower percentages compared to ibrutinib. But acalabrutinib's biggest drawback is its drug interaction with proton pump inhibitors. Given that the drug is taken twice a day, this is gonna be somewhat difficult to manage if you'd like to choose an H2 receptor antagonist or an antacid instead of a proton pump inhibitor. 
So again, a great place for pharmacists to intervene to talk about spacing or changing therapy to avoid this drug interaction. And the third BTKI in the CLL arena is Xanabrutinib. Uh, it has similar instances of bleeding, hypertension, and AFib that we see with acalabrutinib, less than that compared to ibrutinib. But again, this agent has only been out for a very short period of time, so I feel like the data is still forthcoming. Uh, we also see some instances of myelosuppression, pneumonia, and upper respiratory infection, as well as the transient lymphocytosis that I mentioned earlier. Moving on to venetoclax, the BCL2 inhibitor, far and away its most important adverse reaction is going to be tumor lysis syndrome. We don't typically think about tumor lysis syndrome when we consider a chronic leukemia. However, this was a surprise effect in the early trials, and there were actually patient deaths associated with tumor lysis syndrome. So because of that, Venetoclax now has recommendations for what is called a ramp-up dosage schedule. And you can see that uh, the schedule is listed for you here. The ramp-up is actually the terminology that's used in the prescribing information. Um, so I would encourage you to look at your handout as well as the prescribing information to see the other recommendations for the prevention of tumor lysis syndrome, as well as listen to our acute leukemia recording about that topic. Also a reminder that venetoclax does have some drug interactions and dose adjustments may be required. Finally, our PI3K inhibitors, idolalacib and duvelacib. Uh, unfortunately, these appear to have the most severe adverse effects of any of the agents that we discuss in this presentation. It's felt that these agents cause an autoimmune response, which to me looks a lot like graft versus host disease. Um, I'm a recovering bone marrow transplant pharmacist. I'm in my 10th year of recovery, folks. Uh, and to me, this looks a lot like GVH. So we see incidences of LFT elevations and hepatotoxicity. We see a diarrhea or in severe cases, a colitis. There's an early phase that is often self-limited, but a second peak around the nine month mark that can be severe enough to require treatment with corticosteroids. Likewise, we can also see pneumonitis, as well as the transient lymphocytosis seen with the other agents. Um, and unfortunately, there's some rising instances of opportunistic infections in this class of drugs. So we recommend surveillance for CMV, as well as prophylaxis for pneumocystis. So all of these agents have a potential incidence of lymphocytosis. What that term means is the mobilization of lymphocytes out of the lymph nodes and into the circulating blood in response to any of these oral agents. This is most associated with ibrutinib and the PI3K inhibitors. If the patient was paying attention to their own labs, they might notice that after they initiate one of these agents, their lymphocyte count actually goes up. A patient might be tempted to stop taking their agent because they would associate that as their disease is getting worse. But as you can see on the slide here, that rise in a lymphocyte count actually does not signify disease progression. It actually means the drug is working. So what a role for pharmacists here to counsel that patient that when we initiate this agent, you may see your lymphocyte count go up early in your course, it will go down on its own. It does not signify that the drug isn't working, so please keep taking it. We also noticed in the trial of rituximab and idolalacib, the addition of rituximab actually blunted that lymphocytosis and shortened the interval. So if your patient is receiving idolalacib in combination with rituximab, we would not expect such a profound or long response. So putting this all together, for a go-go patient, meaning less than age 65, without significant comorbidities, and this slide is showing you without deletion 17P, the preferred regimens are ibrutinib and acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, both as category one recommendations, but also venetoclax and obinutuzumab as a preferred choice. For a younger, fit patient with mutated IGHV, 
this might be the niche for FCR. Relapse is inevitable, so when that occurs, you would assess what the patient has already received, as well as their comorbid conditions. And some preferred regimens in the second line or subsequent settings would be acalabrutinib, ibrutinib, and venetoclax plus rituximab, all as category one, as well as the PI3K inhibitors, duvelacib and idolalacib. Other recommended regimens are listed for you there, but I wanted to point out the new drug, xanabrutinib, for patients who are intolerant of acalabrutinib and ibrutinib, and that's new this year. For our slow-go patients, which would be greater than or equal to 65 years of age, or younger with comorbidities, or our no-go patients, which would be frail patients, and again, without deletion 17P, there are three category one recommendations in the first line setting, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, and venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. You can see here that FCR is no longer recommended because these patients are a little frailer. When relapse occurs, again, you would reassess the patient's fitness for therapy as well as their prior therapy regimens. Preferred regimens in this setting would be acalabrutinib, ibrutinib, and venetoclax and rituximab, all as category one, and the PI3K inhibitors, duvelacib and idolalacib as well. Uh, once again, under other recommended regimens would be the new drug Xanabrutinib. For patients with the deletion 17P mutation, the recommendations are not broken down by fitness for therapy. The recommendations are the same regardless of the patient's age or comorbidities. First line preferred regimens are acalabrutinib plus or minus obinutuzumab, ibrutinib, and venetoclax plus obinutuzumab. Other recommended regimens are listed for you there, including xanabrutinib. In the relapse and refractory setting, again, you would reassess the patient's fitness for therapy and their comorbid conditions, as well as their prior therapy. And the preferred regimens are actually the same in the second line setting, acalabrutinib, ibrutinib, and venetoclax, this time in combination with rituximab. Likewise, you could use venetoclax as a single agent or the, either of the PI3K inhibitors. So back to our first patient case. He's a 68-year-old male who has been taking a calibrutinib now for the past 18 months. And over the past two weeks, he has noted rapidly enlarging cervical, axillary, and inguinal lymphadenopathy. He also reports new fevers, splenomegaly, and unintentional weight loss. Our audience response question, which of the following is the most likely cause of this patient's new complaints? Is it A, Richter's transformation, B, ibrutinib resistance, C, redistribution lymphocytosis, or D, tuberculosis infection? So the most likely cause of this patient's new complaints is answer A, Richter's transformation. I was testing your recollection. This patient was not on ibrutinib, so he was uh, unlikely to have ibrutinib resistance. He was actually on a calibrutinib. Um, that redistribution lymphocytosis doesn't typically occur after 18 months of therapy, and tuberculosis infections are extremely uncommon in these BITK inhibitor patients. Richter's transformation is a somewhat unusual event where a chronic lymphocytic leukemia becomes a more aggressive lymphoma, typically a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. We're seeing this a little more often, and we're not certain if it's because we're better at detecting it or if it's because of the frequent use of ibrutinib. Regardless, whenever patients transform, they have a rapid disease progression, and their clinical outcome is universally poor. So wrapping this up with some supportive care issues, this is patient number two, a 63-year-old male who will receive idolalacib and rituximab. He has no known drug allergies. Which of the following supportive care medications is most appropriate to initiate at this time? 
Is it A, sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim, B, Zostavax, C, gancyclovir, or D, IVIG? Most appropriate answer here is answer A, sulfamethoxazole or trimethoprim. Um, as we mentioned, idolalacib is associated with an incidence of pneumocystis, so this would be appropriate prophylaxis. And as we go through in the following slides, this patient is not a candidate for any of the other therapies listed here based on the information that you were provided with. Patients with CLL are at risk for infections due to both their underlying disease and the fact that we're using immunosuppressive therapy. The incidence of infection is correlated with reduction in immunoglobulin levels. And we recommend anti-infective prophylaxis for essentially all patients with CLL. So patients receiving purine analogs, the PI3K inhibitors, bendamustine, alemtuzumab, and steroids, all during treatment as well as thereafter. And the specific recommendations for duration are listed in your handout. As we said, a decrease in immunoglobulin levels correlates with the incidence of infection. So it may make sense to give IVIG or intravenous immunoglobulin. Although that practice does decrease the incidence of infections, it does not change the outcome. So the current guidelines suggest that IVIG should only be administered when the serum IgG level is less than 500 and the patient has recurrent sinopulmonary infections that require either antibiotics or hospitalization. Patients with CLL should receive herpes virus prophylaxis with either acyclovir or an equivalent agent. CMV prophylaxis is controversial only because the optimal approach to this is undefined. Most centers use CMV antigen surveillance and will initiate therapy when those titers start to rise. If CMV infection is apparent, we would consider valgancyclovir or IV gancyclovir at that time. CLL patients should also receive prophylaxis for pneumocystis gyrovisii with a sulfamethoxazole and trimethoprim product or equivalent, especially if they are receiving purines, bendamustine, the PI3K inhibitors, or alemtuzumab. Likewise, any patient who's receiving an anti-CD20 monoclonal antibody should undergo screening for hepatitis B. And that is much more detailed in the lymphoma handouts, so I refer you there. Finally, patients with CLL should certainly receive routine vaccinations. It's recommended that they receive the annual influenza vaccine, as well as the pneumococcal vaccine every five years, as indicated for their age. It's recommended that they receive the zoster vaccine recombinant product, not the live product that was one of the choices in the ARS question. Because as you can see there, live vaccines should be avoided in this patient population. So that concludes our discussion on CLL. We're just going to do a few brief slides about hairy cell leukemia, a very unusual, slow-growing form of leukemia that has a newer agent that's been approved and certainly has a lot of unique toxicities that need to be managed. Again, hairy cell leukemia is a very rare type of an indolent B cell leukemia. It's so indolent that patients can go decades before they require any type of treatment. So the decision to initiate therapy is often based on clinical judgment. And you can see some of the reasons to initiate treatment would include recurrent infections, cytopenias, organomegaly, uh, excessive fatigue, or other symptomatic complaints. If treatment is indicated for hairy cell leukemia, the first line therapy is a purine analog, and it's our very old friends, cladribine or pentostatin. Neither agent is preferred. There are multiple routes and schedules that can be used, and neither one of those are preferred. Either way, patients usually receive a significant durable remission, sometimes 10 years or more in between the need for therapy. What you do at relapse depends on how long their initial remission lasted.
if the patient had a relapse more than two years after their first line therapy, you could actually resume the same purine analog. You could add rituximab or you could change between the purine analogs. If the patient had a short duration before they relapsed, and in this case, that would be less than two years, the recommendations would be to choose the alternative purine analog, plus or minus rituximab, as well as interferon, rituxan alone, or vimorafenib, which is discussed in the melanoma module. And that's because most cases of hairy cell leukemia are BRAF positive. Several years ago, a new monoclonal antibody was approved for use in hairy cell leukemia, and that's known as moxitumumab pseudotox, or lumoxity. This is a monoclonal antibody that's directed at CD22, and that molecule binds to CD22 on the surface of B cells and is internalized, leading to apoptosis. It's indicated for relapse or refractory hairy cell leukemia after two or more systemic therapies one of which must be a purine analog. And you can see there, this is an IV product that is given on day one, three, and five of 28-day cycles. Moxitumumab has some interesting adverse reactions. Infusion reactions are extremely common, even with pre- and post-medications, which are detailed very clearly in the handout. Likewise, there are incidences of capillary leak syndrome and hemolytic uremia syndrome, which are quite unusual and, again, are detailed in your handout. Finally, thromboprophylaxis with aspirin is suggested on day one through eight of each cycle. I'd also suggest that you look at the prescribing information because the product is provided with a separate IV solution stabilizer that has to be added in a specific order to properly prepare the product and there is concern for a medication error with those two separate products. So again, please check that out in the prescribing information. Now, moving on to my favorite cancer of all, CML, or chronic myeloid leukemia. I like to say that I am so lucky that I get to talk about my favorite cancers in this review course. So let's take a look. We're going to start off with patient Kate. We have a 42-year-old female who's in excellent health, and she presented for a physical that was required by her new insurance plan. Her blood work revealed a white blood cell count of 94,000 with normal hemoglobin and platelets. And so she was referred to a hematologist for further workup. Ultimately, this patient undergoes a bone marrow biopsy, which is markedly hypercellular. And the cytogenetic analysis is positive for translocation 922, confirming the diagnosis of chronic phase CML, or CPCML. So to get everybody on the same page, a brief review of chronic myeloid leukemia. This is a myeloproliferative expansion of the primitive hematopoietic progenitor cells. And the hallmark of this disease is the reciprocal translocation between the long arms of chromosomes 9 and 22. This translocation is affectionately called the Philadelphia chromosome because the scientists who discovered it were practicing in Philadelphia at the time. And this translocation ultimately results in the formation of the bcr able fusion oncogene, which is a driver of cell division and proliferation. CML is divided into three phases. The chronic phase, where the Philadelphia chromosome is the only chromosomal abnormality and patients are typically asymptomatic. The accelerated phase, where more chromosomal abnormalities begin to appear and patients become more symptomatic. And finally, blast crisis, which actually mimics acute leukemias given its aggressiveness and the number of mutations that can be detected at that point in the patient's course. So the current goals of therapy for a patient with CML are listed on this slide. Number one, we want to maintain that patient in the chronic phase for as long as possible. We want to make sure that the patients don't develop any further chromosome abnormalities and don't become symptomatic from their disease, which leads us into our second goal, 
which is to prevent the progression into a more advanced phase, such as the accelerated phase or blast phase. Since our patients will require years of therapy, we'd like to keep the toxicity of that chronic phase treatment at an absolute minimum. And as we'll discuss, there's some evidence that we may be able to eventually stop the therapy that we initiate for these patients. So that's why I have question marks by number four. We're not quite certain we can say that these patients are cured yet, although the evidence is certainly pointing that there is a small subset of patients who can eventually stop therapy. If we have a patient who presents an accelerated phase or blast crisis or converts there out of the chronic phase, our goal is to get them back into the chronic phase. So essentially calm their disease down back into the chronic phase. So the response criteria for CML are different than most of the other hematologic disorders. So let's review those. First, the most basic response is known as a hematologic response. And you can see here that this is essentially normalization of the blood counts in the peripheral blood. Uh, likewise, the patients shouldn't have any signs or symptoms of disease. However, in 2021, the gold standard is a complete cytogenetic response, which is absolutely no detection of the Philadelphia chromosome. You can see here there are other types of cytogenetic responses, but again, the gold standard in trials in 2021 is the achievement of a complete cytogenetic response. Kind of the holy grail, though, of responses is a molecular response, which is that BCR-ABLE fusion protein is not detectable or has been reduced by a great number of logs, as you can see here, three or more log reduction from baseline. So that's where therapy is going, is that we can measure this down to the molecular level. But most trials and the trials that we'll be talking about use complete cytogenetic response as their endpoint. So let's choose some therapy for our patient. She's 42 years old and has newly diagnosed chronic phase CML and no other comorbid conditions. Her UDOS long-term survival score reveals that she has intermediate disease. So which of the following is the most appropriate initial therapy for this patient? Is it A, imatinib, B, bosutinib, C, ponatinib, or D, omocetaxine? So of the choices that are listed here, the most appropriate for this patient is answer B, bosutinib. Her UDOS long-term survival score reveals that she has intermediate risk disease, which means that imatinib is not the preferred first-line therapy. And as you'll see in the upcoming slides, panatinib and omocetaxine are used in re the relapse and refractory setting. So the best answer here is a second-generation uh, BCR-ABLE TKI, which is bosutinib. So this slide is just a reminder that there are five BCR-ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors currently on the market. The first that was released was imatinib, which completely overhauled the way we treat CML. Our second generation agents are dasatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib. And finally, ponatinib, which has a very high relative potency compared to imatinib, but also has some interesting side effects that make it uh, not the first choice in many of our patients. I also want to draw your attention to the fact that although these agents target BCR-ABLE tyrosine kinase, they also have other numerous targets, and their different targets sometimes translate into the specific adverse events that we'll see for each of these agents. So the trial that cemented imatinib as the gold standard of first-line treatment of CML was called IRIS. And you can see here that over 1,100 patients were randomized to either imatinib or the standard of care at that time, which was interferon and subcutaneous cytarabine. So it shouldn't be a big surprise that imatinib resulted in a greater freedom from progression at 18 months, as well as a very superior complete cytogenetic response or the gold standard at 18 months.
The 10-year follow-up for this study has recently been reported. And you can see here there was a trend for greater overall survival. And that's because of the large number of patients that crossed over from interferon and cytarabine into the imatinib arm over time. So the results from the IRIS study were groundbreaking in that imatinib was the first rationally designed therapy against a hematologic malignancy. Those responses were shocking in a good way. However, over time, we started to see some trends. And if you've heard me give this lecture before, you know what's coming. I like to refer to this as the ghost in the machine. Um, so for people who haven't heard me lecture before, I have a completely inappropriate crush on Sting. I'm actually blushing a little bit right now, just talking about it. And Sting recorded an album with his group, The Police, called Ghost in the Machine. And that imagery of something happening in this machine of imatinib responses is very fitting here. So what happened was that a small portion of patients lost their response within the chronic phase and progressed to advanced phases even while they were on imatinib. So these events were most evident in the first three years. So essentially, there was a blip in the first couple years. And if you could get past that, you were very unlikely to discontinue therapy. So what's the cause of the ghost in the machine? It's two things. Hopefully you're thinking of them right now. Number one is compliance. And number two is resistance. So I'm going to reorient myself and stop thinking about Sting. So the second generation BCR-ABLE TKIs were compared to imatinib as they were released. So we'll look at those one at a time. So first, desatinib compared to imatinib was reported in the decision trial. And you can see here we randomized over 500 patients to either desatinib or imatinib. And desatinib had a better complete cytogenetic response at 12 months as well as a better major molecular response, or the holy grail, at 12 months. However, when we got down to progression-free survival and overall survival, those endpoints were not different between the two agents. So essentially, the satinib got you a better response, and it occurred faster, but it didn't translate to a benefit in progression-free or overall survival compared to imatinib. The trial of nilotinib compared to imatinib was known as Enisten, and this was a three-arm trial of two different doses of nilotinib compared to imatinib in chronic phase CML. Very similar to the decision results. Complete cytogenetic response and major molecular response at 12 months heavily favored nilotinib. However, progression-free survival and overall survival were no different between the two agents. So once again, the second generation, nilotinib, got you a faster and a better response, but that did not translate into a better progression-free or overall survival. Finally, the third second-generation BCR-ABLE TKI is bosutinib, which was compared to imatinib in the before trial. Kind of sounding like a broken record here, bosutinib produced better complete cytogenetic response and major molecular responses at the 12-month mark compared to imatinib, but overall survival was no different between the two agents. So given that we have four BCR-ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors up to this point, the initial choice is based on the patient's risk score, and there's greater details about this in your handout. But essentially, if the patient is low risk for disease progression, any of the four choices are category one in the first line setting for chronic phase CML. However, if the patient is intermediate or high risk of progression, imatinib may be used but desatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib are the category one first line recommendations. So for intermediate or high risk scores, the second generation TKIs are the category one recommendations.
So all of the trials that I've shown you so far have been a second generation TKI compared to imatinib. But unfortunately, there are no direct comparisons of trials between disatinib, nilotinib, and bosutinib. So the choice between those agents is based on any number of criteria, some of which I have listed for you here. The potential toxicities of each of those individual agents, the patient's comorbid conditions, any potential drug interactions, and just the patient and physician's preference at times. So this table summarizes the most important adverse effects of the individual tyrosine kinase inhibitors. So starting on the left, imatinib is quite well tolerated. Its major toxicity is low-grade nausea and periorbital edema. Um, periorbital edema can be treated with diuretics and nausea actually resolves over time. The satinib's major adverse effects are pleural effusions, pleural effusions, and pleural effusions. And I say that because about a quarter of patients will develop a pleural effusion that requires thoracentesis. So thinking about the patient's potential to have such an effect is probably a reason to avoid disatinib. Nilotinib is probably the dirtiest of the second generation TKIs. You can see here that it's associated with QTC interval prolongation and a metabolic syndrome that includes things like pancreatitis and hyperglycemia. Um, it, it's a little harder to tolerate, in my opinion, than some of the other agents here. Bosutinib's main toxicity is GI-related, which is diarrhea, uh, which typically resolves in the first several months, but the patient needs to get through that. And finally, ponatinib has several catastrophic adverse reactions, which is part of the reason we reserve it for later lines of therapy. You can see here they're all going to be circulation or vascular related, so ischemia, vascular occlusion, and hypertension. So what about using a higher dose of imatinib as your initial choice? Would the outcome be any different if we used a higher dose and potentially got to those faster and deeper responses of the second generation TKIs? And that is not currently recommended. Although we may get those higher and faster responses, they are not sustained, and there's just a greater incidence of toxicity with higher doses. So again, that's currently not recommended. So back to our patient. She was started on bosutinib, and after 12 months of therapy, she has not achieved the gold standard complete cytogenetic response. We have ruled out drug interactions and non-adherence with her therapy. So which of the following choices is the most appropriate for this patient at this point in her course? Should we A, increase her bosutinib to twice daily? B, change to high-dose imatinib, C, change to dosatinib, or D, change to ponatinib. So of the answers that are listed here, the most appropriate option is answer C, change to dosatinib. There's no evidence that increasing bosutinib would change this patient's response. And likewise, we've already established that high-dose imatinib is not recommended. You were not given information that states this patient is an appropriate candidate for panatinib. So of the information that you were given, her best option is to change to a different second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which in this case would be disatinib. So what do we do if our initial choice is not successful? If a patient was started on imatinib and needed to change therapy, you would change to a second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor. If the patient had started with a first line second generation tyrosine kinase inhibitor, such as dasatinib, nilotinib, or basutinib, you would change to a different second generation TKI. So essentially you wouldn't go backwards to imatinib, the first generation. The preferred second line TKI is unknown at this time. Again, there are no head-to-head -head trials in this setting. So your choice would be based on what the patient had already received, as well as their comorbid conditions and what sort of adverse effects you're trying to avoid.
And if you have a patient that is so unfortunate that they require third line therapy or beyond, the protein translation inhibitor omocetaxine is indicated in this setting. It's indicated for patients with resistance or intolerance to two or more TKIs. This agent may be worth considering because it's a completely different mechanism of action, but its biggest drawback is that it is subcutaneous injections twice a day. And that is a lot for a patient who has been maintained on oral therapy up to this point. In very, very rare cases, we could consider an allogeneic stem cell transplant. But again, if you're old school like me, that was our bread and butter when I was doing transplant, uh, allogeneic stem cell transplants for CML. And that is essentially a very rare happening in these days because of all these wonderful TKIs. And what a great job of science. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about resistance to the BCR-ABLE tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Primary resistance is extremely rare. What is much more common is secondary resistance that develops over time. And this occurs because of reactivation of BCR-ABLE activity or point mutations in that ABLE kinase domain. The worst mutation is known as T315I, or we call this in clinical practice, the gatekeeper mutation. Uh, it's the worst one. And as you see here, it confers resistance to both the first and second generation TKIs. So essentially all of the TKIs up to this point. If your patient fails to meet those milestone guidelines, like complete cytogenetic response at 12 months, testing the patient for these mutations may help you identify if they have one and which therapy would be the most appropriate moving forward. And again, I have this much more detailed in your handout, so I strongly recommend you take a look at that section. So looking specifically at the T315I mutation or the gatekeeper mutation, the PACE trial examined patients with this and other mutations, and the PACE trial examined panatinib. What it did show us is that panatinib is active in the setting of T315I. Likewise, you could also consider omocetaxine if you detected this particular mutation, since it's not a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And again, in this rare scenario, you could consider an allogeneic stem cell transplant given your patient's specific characteristics. Currently, panatinib is only indicated for patients that have the T315I mutation or for patients in whom no other TKI therapy is indicated, essentially if they are intolerant to them all. This is because of a drug safety communication in October of 2013 which reported an increased frequency of life-threatening blood clots and narrowing of the vessels in the extremities. The drug was actually withdrawn from the market from a period of time. It is now currently available under a REMS program and only for patients with the T315I mutation or patients who have failed multiple other TKIs. Likewise, the recommendation is to start at a much lower dose than the originally studied dose of 45 milligrams daily. There's some evidence that there's less of these life-threatening blood clots with lower doses. So if you had to use panatinib, we would suggest starting at a lower dose. Briefly, I wanted to mention that patients need to be frequently monitored for the responses that they're having. However, this is beyond the scope of this discussion and it's detailed much more in your handout. So again, I refer you there. Um, there are clearly defined recommendations for both the type of testing and the frequency. If the patient does not have the response that you expect or the disease progresses, that's when you would consider mutational analysis to look for those individual mutations. So our final audience response question. Which patient counseling point about TKIs is correct? Is it A, food does not impact the effectiveness of TKIs, B, adherence with TKI therapy is directly associated with outcome, C, TKIs should be taken once daily to maintain serum steady state concentration, or D, TKIs will be discontinued if the major molecular response is sustained for two years?
So the correct answer is answer B. Adherence with TKI therapy is directly associated with outcome. We'll show you that answers A and C are not correct in the next couple slides. And answer D was a wording situation. This says that TKIs will be discontinued. And unfortunately, at this point, it's only in patients who meet very specific criteria. It's certainly not all patients, which we'll review in the upcoming slides. So this slide is basically for your reference. You can see here that imatinib, dasatinib, and bosutinib are all daily medications, but nilotinib is twice daily. So I would say that's strike one. <laughs> Uh, in terms of food, nilotinib must be taken on an empty stomach, which I would say is strike two. Uh, finally, there's CYP3A4 interactions with all of the agents, as well as some other additional drug interactions, such as H2A receptor antagonists and PPIs with dasatinib, as well as frequent monitoring of electrolytes with nilotinib. So for me, that's strike three. Um, and the same recommendations for bosutinib. So we can't discuss CML without discussing adherence. This has become a truly chronic disease. Patients with CML now have a life expectancy that is almost the same as the general population. So once again, science, we have kept these patients alive long enough to have them pass away from some other chronic condition. The landmark trial that confirmed adherence directly correlates to outcome is known as Adagio, which showed that poor adherence is the most important factor contributing to cytogenetic relapse. So can we ever stop TKIs? Again, CML has truly become a chronic disease. So now we're now thinking for the long term. We're thinking about quality of life and financial concerns, as well as some young ladies may eventually want to have children. So several studies have investigated whether TKIs can be discontinued, and these studies have only been done in patients who have sustained deep molecular responses, so essentially long-term holy grail responses. And we don't like to use the term cure here, so we use the term TFR, treatment-free remission. These discontinuation studies are detailed in your handout, but what you should be aware of is that all of them had very strict eligibility criteria. And the results of these studies showed that about 40% of patients who had achieved a stable deep molecular response could remain in TFR after stopping first-line treatment. So slightly less than half of the patients could actually discontinue these agents. For the patients who did lose their response, they lost it quickly. 80% of the patients who lost their response did so within six months of stopping the TKI, and restarting the therapy was successful in most of the cases. Kind of somewhat unusually, though, is what's called a treatment withdrawal syndrome. So upon stopping the TKI, patients complained of flu-like symptoms and muscle aches that really can't be explained by the mechanism of those drugs, um, but again, certainly a counseling point for patients in this setting. So NCCN says that discontinuing TKIs may be considered outside of the setting of a clinical trial only in patients who meet very specific criteria. And those are listed for you here. But what I want to draw your attention to is the patient has to consent to discontinuation after a thorough discussion of the potential risks and benefits. For the patients who present or progress into accelerated phase, your goal is to get them back to the chronic phase. If they had been on imatinib, you would choose a second generation TKI. If they had been on a second generation TKI, you would switch to a different one. And you could consider omisataxine if they were resistant or intolerant to two or more TKIs, or you can consider allogeneic stem cell transplant. Finally, for patients who present or progress to blast crisis, your goal is to return them to the chronic phase. And unfortunately, that's only successful about half the time. Treatment would be aimed at whatever acute leukemia they have developed. So if they've developed an AML, you would treat with those regimens. If they've developed an ALL, you would treat with those regimens. And I refer you to the leukemia handout for that information. If the patient is able to achieve a chronic phase, stem cell transplant should be recommended at that point. Thank you.
So that's our final slide. I wanted to thank ASHP and ACCP for giving me the privilege of delivering this lecture. It's always my honor to spend this time with you. Best of luck to you in all your studies, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, everybody.